When the defense took the field in 1971, it faced the most awesome array of runners in the history of college football. Ready? Right, Howie, right. What's a quick count? What's a quick count? Play it normal. Play it normal. Jeff Kinney was the leading runner on the national champion Nebraska Cornhusker. He was also an All-America candidate. Like all college scholar athletes, Jeff's season started before the summer was over. 71! Pretty deep, what's the draw? 71! Hut, hut! Nebraska coach Bob Devaney was preparing his team for a long, tough schedule. The emphasis on many college practice fields was to develop a powerful running game. Jeff Kinney and many ball carriers like him exploded in 1971. More single game, season, and career rushing records were smashed than in any other period in football history. It was the year of the record-breaking runner. As chairman of the coaches' selection committee, Bob Devaney studied game action film and the leading All-America candidates. Here, Devaney is watching Oklahoma's Joe Wiley prior to Nebraska's big showdown with the Sooners on Thanksgiving Day. By continually scouting future opponents, Devaney and his fellow coaches know by the end of the season who the best players are. The young men you are looking at are all outstanding athletes. Our job is a tough one, picking the select few who are all Americans. Each game we play, we receive three of our opponents' game films in advance. In this way, we see players in game action from four different schools. Most teams play a 10 or 11 game schedule. So we see better than 40 different teams during the season. And you figure there are possibly 1,000 coaches who are doing this and casting their ballots for the All-American team. By the end of the season, we know which boys had outstanding years and are deserving of this special honor. Nineteen seventy one was an outstanding year for big agile defenders. These young men take pride in stopping the offense. At their positions, they are the best defensive football players in college football. With all the emphasis on running and scoring in nineteen seventy one, it took a particularly rugged breed of linemen to excel on defense. One who did was a big six six senior who anchored the immovable Notre Dame front four. Walt Potalski, number 85, came to South Bend as a fullback. His bruising power to run down and destroy enemy ball carriers immediately impressed the Irish coaches, and Walt Potalski joined the defense. In the last two seasons, Potalski has been credited with 134 individual tackles. 
Nobody blocked Walt Podolsky for long. He was a man with a mission. And yet, he says he finds a certain artistic enjoyment in this game many call violent. I don't, you know, look at myself as a violent person. I think uh, it's too much enjoyment, and uh, there's a lot of finesse and a lot of beauty in football. I, I try to look at it that way rather than as being a, a violent person and trying to hate somebody. Walt Patulski has all the necessary qualifications to be an All-American. He's a defensive left end on our football team for the last three years. He's been very difficult to run inside or outside on and puts an immense rush on the passer. And uh, he's one of the finest defensive ends that I've ever coached at the University of Notre Dame. Four years ago, this man, a high school dropout, was guarding the Berlin Wall. He was wearing an American soldier's uniform. Berlin, Germany is a long way from Boulder, Colorado, but it was across the Atlantic, in Europe, where coach Eddie Crowder first met Herb Orvis. They have been together ever since. Orvis, number 88, has been the bulwark of the Colorado defense for three years. Forcing a fumble or surrounding a runner with the Orvis bear hug, number 88 plays defense the way it was meant to be played. Few opponents escape the wrath of Herb Orvis. This is the University of Nebraska, located in the heart of the Corn Belt and at the top of the football world. There was no tougher defense in 1971, and its cornerstone was Larry Jacobs at number 75. Coach Bob Devaney respected the tall Cornhusker. Larry Jacobson has been a tower of strength in our defense and is responsible for the great defensive record that our line has come up with this past year. Our defense is really a, a close unit, and we like to stick together. And it's just a feeling of, of being in the, in the group and uh, just doing a good job and uh, Bringing, bringing back a little pride to the school. Each week on the NCAA TV game, Robert Lund, general sales manager, Chevrolet Motor Division, presented $1,000 scholarships to the schools representing that game's outstanding offensive and defensive players. One of the season's winners was Ron Curl, Michigan State, for his play against Big Ten champion Michigan. Curl was constantly in the Wolverine backfield and batted down four passes. Against Notre Dame, Curl's jarring tackle forced a safety, marking one more clutch play by Ron Curl, another in the long line of defensive greats from Michigan State. Louisiana State University, where pretty southern bells and hard-hitting defense are a way of life. I want the dead gum shoulder pad in his head here, like so, and I want the damn forearm right there. Now get it there. Ron Este, number 78, has taken that kind of rugged training for four years and turned it loose on the enemy. The rock of the LSU defense, Ron Este, is a tackler with determination. The coaches also selected California's Sherman White in the six-man defensive line. The key to a good defense is the linebacker. He must be tough enough to overpower the blocker and make the tackle. There were some exceptional linebackers in 1971 and they deserve All-America recognition. Here's one of the best at work. He's Michigan linebacker Mike Taylor. This 6'2 senior from Detroit has amazing speed, enough to leave his man, catch a back from behind, and save a touchdown. Taylor was the leading tackler on the nation's top defense against rushing and scoring. 
With all America, Mike Taylor leading the charge, Michigan's end zone was truly a no man's land for enemy ball carriers. The 1972 Rose Bowl featured two All-America linebackers, Taylor of Michigan and Stanford's Jeff Seaman. Seaman, number 92, constantly made the big play for the Stanford defense. For Seaman and Stanford, a second straight Pacific 8 title. It's often been said the loneliest job in football belongs to the defensive back. He's engaged in a do-or-die, one-on-one war, and his every move is out in the open. Win or lose, it's a pressure job, says Notre Dame's Clarence Ellis. When you mess up and the ball gets past you and the touchdown is made, you're the only two people on that field, it seems. So it's kind of a personal challenge every time you go on the field. And when somebody beats you, well, then uh, you figure you got to get yourself back up again. The game's not over, and... Uh, there's a lot more games to be played. Clarence Ellis, number 23. Notre Dame's cat quick cornerback has knocked down more passes than any other player in Irish history. Coach Eric Persigian calls Ellis the best defensive back he's ever coached. The senior from Grand Rapids turned defeat into victory with this jolting tackle in the Purdue game. Clarence Ellis has learned to play with pressure and win. In Knoxville, Tennessee, a family legend is nearing an end. Number 44 is Bobby Major, the baby of the fabulous Majors family. Bobby starred for three years at Tennessee. He is a young man who was really born to play football. And I was raised up, you know, all my life around football and sports in general, but mainly football because my father's a coach. And I had two brothers to play up here. John, who's now head coach at the University of Iowa State, and Bill, who was killed in 1965 in a car train accident. And Joe, who played at Florida State, was a quarterback. And my brother Larry, who played under my father at the University of the South. So uh, I've been around an environment, you know, it's pretty much football. Bobby Majors, final brilliant star of a fantastic football family. The Blue Devils of Duke are proud of their 60-minute hero, Ernie Jackson. Number 13 went both ways, running as an offensive halfback and blasting enemy ball carriers. Another outstanding ball hawk was Tom Darden of Michigan. The Wolverines wound up 1971 undefeated, and it was Tom Darden who saved a victory over Ohio State with this clutch interception, preserving one of the Wolverines' greatest seasons ever. Again, let's look at the defensive backs. Football is more than tackles, blocks, and scores. Here's an All-America salute to some other stars of an autumn Saturday. coaches look for speed, quickness, and determination when they are rating the young men moving the football. A lot of points were scored in 1971, 
And here are some of the athletes who made it possible, the offense. When the national champion Nebraska Cornhuskers took the field in 1971, their game breaker was Johnny Rogers. Only a junior, this 5'10 receiver has been hailed as Nebraska's most exciting player ever. With one year to play, Rogers is breaking all of Nebraska's pass receiving and punt return records. Also quite a baseball player, Johnny Rogers thrilled Cornhusker fans and chilled Nebraska's opponent. This twisting punt return helped beat Oklahoma in the year's biggest game and earned the All-America spot for number 20, Johnny Rogers. started for All-America's Terry Beasley and Pat Sullivan. When Sullivan signed with uh, Auburn and Beasley signed with Auburn, one coming from Birmingham, one from Montgomery, they didn't know uh, each other at all. They met that summer and started working together on their own, just in little parks and little league baseball diamonds, throwing and catching. Uh, now that's dedication. On that play there, when I'm taking a slant, I'm going to try to uh, draw a safety man up. So you can take a little bit more time and just beat that halfback and we ought to be able to get it in between the halfback and safety and that post. Make it outside uh, fake back? Yeah, you can go ahead and make it outside fake back. When Sullivan and Beasley came to Auburn, the Tigers had lost 23 games in five years. Immediately, Auburn completed a pair of eight and two seasons. The aerial partnership of Sullivan and Beasley was the renaissance of Auburn football. Speed to burn is what the scouts say about Terry Beasley, a 5'11 senior from Montgomery, Alabama. Rival coaches claim Beasley may be the best all-around receiver in Southeastern Conference history. And who could know Terry Beasley any better than his partner, Pat Sullivan? He's a real hard-working, uh, dedicated person. Uh, he always keeps himself in, in excellent shape. And he's really a, a dedicated person and a dedicated football player. And I think anybody that's around him is impressed by him. Teammates called Beasley the little redhead. But when he had the football in his hands, Terry Beasley was a game breaker. One half of a devastating duo, Auburn's Terry Beasley. Before Beasley can catch, Somebody's got a pitch. That's Pat Sullivan. Says Beasley, it's easy when Pat Sullivan is your quarterback. About Sullivan, Beasley says a lot more. Well, Pat, he's a uh, he's a lot calmer. You know, in the, when he calls the plays, he's a lot he's a real smart quarterback. And also, like dropping back to throw the ball, he don't just follow me when I run my pass route. Cause if he looked at me the whole time, then it would be easier for them to cover me. And uh, he makes it a lot easier for me. Pat Sullivan rewrote the SEC record book and was responsible for 71 touchdowns, a national career record. But most of all, Pat Sullivan was a clutch player and winner of the 1971 Heisman Trophy as college football's player of the year. Now, let's meet the men who cleared the path for those receivers and passers. The All-America Offensive Line. At Penn State, Joe Paterno considered his tackle, Dave Joyner, one in a million. Dave Joyner is the best offensive tackle we've had at Penn State in the 22 years I've been at Penn State. We've had some fine offensive linemen, but nobody has been as consistent as he has. He just has blocked everybody we've played. There's someone else watching number 70 at Penn State games. Dave's wife, Carolyn, is a cheerleader. They were married early in the football season, a few hours after Penn State beat Air Force. Go, 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 go! Go! Go, Mitch! Go! 
Carolyn Joyner cheers for the Penn State team, but keeps a special note of pride for one player, her husband. At Alabama, Bear Bryant was equally proud of his 273-pound tackle. John Hanner is the greatest blocker I've ever been around. He's tremendously large, and he has quickness for a man that size. He's very intelligent. He comes off the ball very well, and I think one of the outstanding blockers in the nation. One of the biggest players ever recruited by the Bear, John Hanna, Alabama blockbuster. The Texas Longhorns wrapped up their fourth straight Southwestern Conference title. And a key to the feared Texas running attack was Jerry Sizemore, a 247-pounder who moved tacklers out of the way. At Georgia, Coach Vince Dooley says there wasn't a better blocker in America than number 66, Roy Smith. Smith's ambition from his first day at Georgia was to make all America. Roy Smith reached that goal. The coach's All-America center is Tom Brahaney of the Oklahoma Sooners. Brahaney takes his place with the All-America offensive line. In 1968, the wishbone offense stormed into college football. The option, keep it or pitch it, as one coach says, simply outnumbers the defense. With the refinement of the option play came the success of the men who carry the football. In 1971, their abilities reached an all-time high. It was a year for record-breaking runners everywhere. It is if Bobby Moore of Oregon set the West Coast on fire. Penn State's Lydell Mitchell revamped the line rushing records and scored more touchdowns than any runner in the history of college football. Billy Taylor was Michigan's top ground gainer, moving ahead of Tom Harmon and Ron Johnson in the Wolverines record book. Jeff Kinney scored the key touchdowns and powered Nebraska to a national championship. Picking only four runners from among all of 1971's greatest was a tough problem. We studied film of a great many running backs this season and found it quite difficult to narrow our selections to just a few. However, here are the talented young men we believe were the top runners in 1971. The first major college runner to gain 350 yards in a single game. Michigan State's Eric the Flea Allen. When number 24 from Georgetown, South Carolina breaks a run, nobody is going to catch him. The pride of the Big Ten, Eric Allen. To meet another All-America running back, Let's join the fun at Homecoming Day, 1971, in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Many hours of hard work are shared by students on campuses like this all over the country. Another reason college football has become an American tradition. A major object of all this attention was the Crimson Tide's fabulous Johnny Musso. Number 22 gained a reputation for doing it all. On the Alabama campus, the nation's winningest coach, Bear Bryant, knew he had an All-America candidate the first time he saw Musso. I can't say too much about John Musso because he's a complete football player. A complete football player who catches passes, makes bruising tackles, and runs. He 
he runs very well. He's a tough runner where he's thick. He uh, has tremendous balance and determination. And actually, the best thing he does is block. Uh, for instance, against LSU, he goes up and blocks the safety on the ground. Terry Davis kept the ball in here for the score. Some of the best runs he's ever made has been for three or four yards without any blocking. We had fourth down and three, I believe it was. And we ran a power play in here where we just one on one block. And uh, this man goes block here. But anyway, nobody had a clean block. And the uh, quarterback gave Musso the ball here. And he kept fighting, butting and fighting and squirming and wound up making the first down. When I'm running and I, and I get hit or something and I think I'm going down, one thing I try to do is take, take one last step. And if I can get that step, I'll fight to get one more. And uh, you'll be falling forward, you know, just taking one step at a time. And then basically, you know, when, when you don't think you can get one more, I just try to take one last step and get the most out of every play that I can. The Southeastern Conference's all-time leading runner, Alabama's Johnny Musso, is a portrait in rugged determination. In Norman, Oklahoma, the name Greg Pruitt is synonymous with success. The only junior in the All-America backfield, Pruitt says, my secret is to keep moving. I figure it's harder to hit a moving target. After Oklahoma whipped Texas, a Longhorn player said, Pruitt is so fast, he's hard to see. The 5'9 speedster led the Sooners to all sorts of NCAA offense records and is the reason Oklahoma fans shout, let Pruitt do it. <laughs> Topping off the All-America backfield is college football's new all-time leading runner, Cornell's Ed Marinero. You measure his accomplishments in miles, not yards. For three straight years, Ed Marinero led the country in yards gained per game. No one ever matched that feat. One of Marinero's talents is excellent peripheral vision. His coach says he runs with his eye. Five times in 1971, Ed Marinero gained more than 200 yards a game. That's another new mark. He ran for more yards in a season and in a career than anyone else in football history. An Ivy Leaguer from New Milford, New Jersey, Ed Marinero ran as the king of his sport. He was the runner who broke the most records in the year of the record-breaking runner. You have just seen in action our selections for the 1971 Coaches All-America team. It's made up of dedicated performers who put it all together, both in the classroom and on the playing field. Each one has earned the title All-America. Now speaking for the All-America Selection Committee, I want to thank all of you fans for your overwhelming support of college football. <laughs> 